people who eat fish in the U.S. don't like fish, really. Yeah. They, 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 they like the sauce that is on it. <laughs> and, um, hey guys, I'm Eric Olson, and welcome to another episode of the Science Centric Podcast. As a young kid growing up in Seattle, I remember getting up early to go fishing on Lake Washington in the fall. The surface of the lake, which is normally as smooth as glass in the early morning, rippled with Chinook, Coho, and Sockeye salmon, making their way from the ocean to their spawning grounds in the various creeks and rivers that feed the lake. The experience must have made quite an impression on me because I still remember it more than 30 years later. It's one of my earliest memories of wildlife in nature. I live in New York City these days, so I don't spend much time on Lake Washington. But I doubt that if I took my seven-year-old son out on the lake today, he'd have much the same experience that I did. Salmon numbers have plummeted in the Seattle area in the last 35 years. Overfishing, dams, pollution, disease, artificial light, and harmful algae blooms may all be playing a role. But for me and my son, nature as we experience it in our childhood, with or without salmon, forms the basis for what we consider normal. That change, that generational shift in our perception of our environment, was given a name by marine biologist Daniel Pauly in 1995. He coined the term shifting baselines in an influential essay published in an academic journal. The essay has gone on to be widely cited, and the concept is now applied to other generational paradigm shifts. Today, Daniel Pauly is a professor of marine biology at the University of British Columbia and is the principal investigator of the Sea Around Us project, which seeks to understand the impact that fisheries have on the world's oceans. He's also got a new book out, a kind of greatest hits of his essays over the years. In our wide-ranging interview, we talked about the origin of the shifting baselines concept, the current state of the world's oceans, why overfishing is a problem, and what we as individuals can do about it. Before we dive into it, I just wanted to mention that you can help support this independently produced podcast by heading over to sciencecentric.com support. Without further ado, here's Daniel Pauly. Dr. Pauly, uh, thank you so much for joining me today on the Science Centric podcast. Uh, we're really honored to have you here. A pleasure too for me. Okay. Um, and go ahead with your question. <laughs> okay, sure. So you have a new book out. Uh, it's a collection of essays. Um, it's called Vanishing Fish, Shifting Baselines, and the Future of Global Fisheries. Um, so my, my first question to you is, why did you put this book together, and why is it needed now? Well, the last part of this question, I, I don't know uh, <laughs> if it is needed. There are lots of books that are published now. Um, uh, I assembled the book together because I had the time. Uh, I was uh, doing a half sabbatical uh, two years ago in New at New York University. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, the the essays were waiting, and there are some. Uh, I had published lots of essays in uh, uh, in uh, the last ten twenty years, and uh, the the idea came up to put them together, and some of them are very successful uh, the one on on shifting baseline had a big impact yeah. so they they are put together in a in a in a book that contextualized and that uh, that provides the ramification of the of the various ideas and so um uh, my my vision of fisheries and uh, of the problem that besets our planet uh, is kind of put together in this way uh-huh yeah, and I, I really did enjoy, I really enjoy your writing style. You have a really um, sort of, uh, I would call a biting wit to some of your writing. And, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little, got a little bit of an edge to it, but I, I really appreciate that, so. Yes, the, the reason for that is because uh, I'm writing mainly for myself, to amuse myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I'm not writing with an, uh, really with an audience is in mind because, uh, I, and so, so um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm writing to amuse myself. And and if if something that I find funny 
will be find will be found to be funny by somebody else. This is bonus. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 while we're talking about that um one of one of the sort of smaller questions i had for you was about these these wallet cards that everybody has uh that that have the red uh yellow and green fish and and it's supposed to tell you which fish are okay to eat and and the uh, you know, that are responsible and sustainable. Yeah. Um, I noticed a couple of points in the book, you take issue with that. And, and yes. what, what is the issue with those? Because I well, think people who use them think that they're doing the, doing the right thing. Um, that is a, a serious issue. And um, this has to do with um, activism that could be called horizontal versus activism that is vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, when you, when you, decide to, in a restaurant, to use the wallet card, you are directing uh, your disapproval of this fish being on the menu to some young woman who is trying to, uh, to pay her rent uh, at the end of the month uh, and who is perhaps a student at a community college. Uh -huh. And uh, she has absolutely, or he, if it's a guy, uh, no possibility of passing on your, your disagreement with, with, with the offerings of the menu mm -hmm. to higher authorities, and she will not. So what, what these what this wallet cards give, they give you a feeling of, 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 of you are a good person, but they actually don't have any vertical effect on on the wholesaler or on uh, suppliers and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, the energy that we have uh, as uh, uh, and the the dislike of of the form that fish are offered to us or or other goods, it it should not be expressed horizontally. It should express vertically. That is. Uh, we, we should support or even do it ourselves, uh, uh, distribute leaflets in front of the, of the, of the big companies or the, the wholesaler that, that sell that stuff that is stolen or caught illegally or so. So vertical pressure has a big effect, mm -hmm. but horizontal pressure has no effect. It, it really is uh, guilt-based and it, you assuage your guilt. Mm -hmm. It is not shame-based. Shame, shaming a company for uh, selling fish that is caught illegally or by slaves, that is, uh, shaming a company will work. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but guilt, guilt is, a, is, a, is a thing that only the Catholic Church can do something with. That's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So, I mean, it's really about uh, speaking truth to, to power, to the people that have the power to actually make changes that, rather than people that are sort of on the bottom that, that are just trying to make their way in the world like the rest yeah. of us. Yes. <laughs> Great. Yes. I think your work uh, may be more, most popularly known for this idea of shifting baselines, uh, a, a term that you coined in an essay that's, that's uh, in, your, in your book. Um, and the, and, and correct me if I mess, if I'm messing this up, but the basic idea is that, um, you know, from gen generation to generation, we have a bit of amnesia and, or, or collective ignorance about what nature was like before we were born. And so we're, we're, our baseline is set when we're children in terms of what we remember, um, about how we grew up and how, how the natural world was. Um, and I guess my question to you is, where did this idea originate, and um, has has your thinking on this changed at all uh, since you first wrote about it in 1995? So, in 95, I received a, an early email from a very senior scientist, a very prestigious person, who asked me. He, at the time, was the editor of a journal, a scientific journal called Tree Trends in Ecology and Evolution, and he asked me to fill in one page that was uh, somebody had not delivered in time and they needed just one page to go to press. Uh, it could have been, I could have written anything actually. <laughs> and, and I think I grabbed the idea out of the air because it was in the air at the time. And now I recall that I read something like that in a novel that I found in a hotel wow. uh, in, in, in the 80s in Florida somehow. Uh, 
the, this thing was in the air, but it was in a novel and it was not expressed the way it was. Um, and I, I wrote this in an afternoon and sent it, and uh, and it was it was one page, and it became cited and cited and cited, and now it is cited thousands of times, and and it has reached way outside of the of the fisheries world where I had put put it first. Um, uh, in, it has reached into culture. It has reached uh, into into economics and so on. And it has it has been used to assess not only things that go bad, but things that go go better, and you forget about them. For example, vaccination. We 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 don't need vaccination anymore. People think because we don't get sick anymore. <laughs> that is shifting baseline also mm-hmm. because people project the health that we have backward. And think that people were healthy also again before, but no, this is because of vaccination that we don't have that. So uh, it it can be used uh, all ki- in all kind of ways, and uh, and it, it has. Uh, you you said that uh, it is my most uh, successful papers or, or ID. This is the only one of my ideas that I, that has reached out of my of my discipline mm-hmm. or marine science altogether. But actually, uh, other things that I've done are much more cited, actually, yeah. uh, scientifically. So, so I, I, I look at this uh, certainly as the, 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 the essay with the big, biggest benefit, uh, cost-benefit ratio. It's one page that got me lots of money. Um, but it was in the air at the time. And uh, in 95, this was published, and now it's, it's being credited in various papers that with helping to create the discipline of marine ecological uh, historical marine ecology mm-hmm. uh, people now try to rebuild um, scenarios of, of the past that allow us to assess the the really the the the, the magnitude of change because uh, if we if we rely on our personal experience to assess the magnitude of change, we underestimate change. Mm-hmm. So one question about that, and uh, you you did address this in the book a little bit, but how reliable are historical records? You know, going back to say the eighteen seventeen eighteen hundreds. I remember reading a book about um, this area, about, or an account about this area about oysters in New York Harbor and that they were the size of dinner plates and you know I'm, I, I, can we count on those those reports those anecdotes uh, as part of that historical record as par- as data for the for for shifting baselines well yes that that, mm-hmm. that the whole discipline of uh, marine historical ecology is actually uh, structured around that question mm-hmm. um, uh, about uh, when people say they were fish, you could call catch them with a bucket, or you could walk on their back. Actually, you you couldn't. But <laughs> fishing fish with a bucket is possible hmm. uh, when they are in a dense school. So basically, what 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 marine historical ecology does is sifting through these various accounts and extracting coherent uh, coherent narratives that and and, and numbers that. Uh, uh, can withstand cru- uh, scrutiny and can be used as a uh, target for rebuilding, for mm-hmm. example, rebuilding scenario. Because the observation that an animal was there is as factual as uh, as uh, uh, the measurement with an atomic clock. I mean, there is no, right? They, if they were oysters, and they were oysters, and, and, uh, and, and they, if they drew oysters, dinner plate, that they were big, that, that uh, We'll we'll have to examine because uh, dinner plates have have become bigger over time. <laughs> so so you have to take account of the size of dinner. Plate. And yeah. when you do that, pro- when you do all the things properly, you end up with with a record that uh, challenges views about uh, what the past was, and and it's coherent, it's credible, mm-hmm. and uh, agencies. Agencies like fishery, fisheries department and so on often have problems with this reconstruction because the stocks of fish, for example, are so low that rebuilding them to this past abundance 
is impossible. Yeah. But but it 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 gives an aspirational goal at least. Right. Yeah. Right. Hey, I just wanted to take a quick pause to thank HostGator, this episode's sponsor. HostGator is one of the world's top 10 largest web hosting companies with over 8 million hosted domains. They have around-the-clock support and all shared web hosting plans include a 45-day money-back guarantee. I've personally used HostGator since 2008 for all of my hosting needs, and I couldn't be happier. Sign up today using the promo code SCIENCE and you'll receive 25% off any new hosting plan. So shifting gears a little bit. So you're the principal investigator uh, and founder, I believe, for the See Around Us project, yeah. uh, which started in 1999. Um, and the goal, uh, as I as written on your website, is uh, to assess the impact of fisheries on the marine ecosystems of the world um, and offer mitigating solutions to a range of stakeholders. So. Um, my very broad question to you is what what is this project found um and what are the impacts of fisheries on marine ecosystems um particularly in the last 50 years and um maybe we'll just start with that yeah so in in uh, 97 i was invited along with uh, um maybe as an imposter, along with a, a group of five, six very senior marine biolog- marine scientists to the Pew Travel Trust, the uh, uh, philanthropic organization in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, Dr. Josh Reichert, at the time the director of the environmental group, asked each of these scientists, um, essentially, if you have lots of money, what would you do to assess the health of the ocean? Are we impacting the health of the ocean, and how would you do to assess? What would you do to assess it? Mm-hmm. And each of them said, "We have no data, and we would need to set up a big data acquisition program." And I positioned myself to be last, and uh, I, <clears throat> I, I answered then when it was my turn. I said, "But we have done research uh, in the last." hundred years, oceanographic research and uh, biological research, and, and we have no data? This is, this is ridiculous. We have data. Notably, we have data about fisheries that are the catch data, the catch uh, reports that the FAO compiles, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, compiles, and we can see the vessels as sampling the ocean. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a messy sample. This is, uh, but I had I had just written uh, a paper uh, on um, on uh, the uh, uh, on fishing down marine food web that was based uh, in science that was based on on this data and I could show change in the ecosystem mm-hmm. and and so I proposed to to use uh, the FAO data uh, as as uh, as pillar of uh, of uh, or a series of studies that would uh, that would describe the impact on of fisheries on ecosystem. Mm-hmm. The the best basically the the fisheries messes up the ecosystem because it removes the biggest fish. Mm-hmm. Fish. Yeah. So I was uh, Dr. Reichert sent all these people away, and I was asked to stay, and I was asked to submit a proposal which everybody thought was was crazy. Mm-hmm. He had sent it to eight people, and uh, uh, he put his head on the chopping block and he said, you here are two million bucks <laughs> that you can you, and do the North Atlantic at first. Uh-huh. And uh, because the North Atlantic is, has been well studied actually. Uh-huh. And within two years, we had a, a, a description of the, of the of the North Atlantic that was radically different from the 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 species by species, stock by stock, fishery by fishery accounts. We could describe the North Atlantic as as a as a region that has been ravaged and big fish had overall declined by ten by a uh, factor of ten uh, almost everywhere in the North Atlantic. Yeah, and uh, this was a. Uh, uh, Revelation, in a sense, and a mode of operation that was very different from uh, what uh, the other environmental group were doing, and mm-hmm. 
the other scientists which were doing because fishery scientists um, uh, generally uh, work for government and they advise on 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 one fishery at a time and mm -hmm. one local fishery at a time and it was the first time that a, a large area was was analyzed with the target not being the regulation of fishery but being being uh, the stakeholder group that was meant was actually the civil society mm -hmm. and their armor groups. They could do, they could then orient or base a campaign uh, around what are you doing to our ecosystems, <laughs> right? And and this this view, this this approach was completely new. Uh, it was global. It was a uh, large scale, sorry, and. Uh, and addressed to civil society as opposed to addressed to government uh, regulatory agencies. Uh -huh. And so the, the, the Pew gave me uh, uh, renewed grants to expand this globally. Wow. And uh, we they supported uh, us for 15 years. Uh -huh. We parted way uh, very amicably and uh, we got uh, funding from uh, the poll uh, Paul Allen Family uh, Foundation, mm -hmm. and now from a variety of groups, um, it's better to have uh, lots of funders than just one. Yeah. And and we have continued to deliver to deliver a vision of fisheries that uh, is starkly different from that of other fishery scientists who work on one species at a time, because notably, we because we mapped fisheries in the world, we were able to show that fisheries expand geographically in depth and in catching more different species. So they are in constant expansion, like the economy, and right. they cannot survive if they don't expand because they are not sustainable. The, the fisheries leave basically one stock devastated after the other, they, they move. Uh -huh. and, they and, so that's, and so that's something that you can see uh, in the data that you c collected, you can see uh, well, uh, catch data that 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 one stock is going down and another cat, you, you know, amount of catch is going up. Official FAO data, you yeah. can see it very well, but nobody mapped them in that way, uh, nobody analyzed them in in view of of checking the expansion, mm. and it became even more visible when we engage in another monster project, which is to correct the the data, the official data, uh, for the omission of certain fisheries. Uh, the official data, and it's official, do not include discarded fish. You know, the, the, the fish that you don't market. That right. is just way. It, it doesn't include catches by recreational fisheries, mm -hmm. even though they can be very big. It doesn't include catches uh, that are made by, for subsistence, uh, women collecting uh, things on reefs and stuff that is very common in the in tropical world or in Alaska for that matter. Yeah. It doesn't include uh, illegal catches that everybody knows are being made mm -hmm. and so on. So we, we, we did, uh, we, we engaged in a big project that lasted 15 years actually yeah. and it's recently concluded of reconstructing the catch. Uh, basically we start with the official catch of FAO and we, we add uh, all the, the fisheries that are omitted. Yeah. And uh, uh, some agencies are very transparent. For example, NOAA of the U.S. is very transparent, has helped us a lot. Some agencies are, are not. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had a huge network of 400 people in the world helping us. And uh, we produce this, and it's all available on our website. Yeah. And lots of people are now using it. And is there, uh, do we have a, do you have an overall sense about, you know, how much fish we're removing from the ocean every year? Yes. I mean, yes, what, what, is, what are those figures? About uh, 130 million tons per year are uh -huh. being caught, uh, as opposed to 80 to 90 million tons officially. Okay. And, but since the, since 96, to be precise, uh, the overall catch, the catch of the world is declining. Uh, uh, about 1.3 million ton per year less. And is that, um, be, is that because the, the stocks have declined? Yeah, yeah. Because, that, because the expansion uh, has nowhere to go. And, and so 
before you could uh, hide the decline of non-sustainably exploited stocks by 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 uh, having including new stocks that you were exploited uh. but at some point at some point when the expansion doesn't work anymore then uh, you start noticing that you are not working sustainably and and that is what's happening to fisheries and and uh, this message has now been conveyed i think uh, people have no argument i also i should add the fisheries statistics of the world were falsified by some countries that report fantastically high catches for political reason mm -hmm. uh, that is china was the case uh, we we wrote a paper on that it was a big big fuss and uh, some other countries like vietnam and myanmar and stuff they have fantasy data yeah um so <clears throat> this is probably a good segue to talk about one of the more uh, provocative essays, I would say, in the book, uh, and it's titled Homo Sapiens, Cancer or Parasite? <laughs> but <laughs> I thought that um, I thought that it, it really had you really had some interesting ideas in there. And um, it's a good segue from what we were just talking about. But this idea that the economy, what we call the economy, quote unquote, is is really sort of its own ecosystem that uh, was really just built for us. Um, and that, you know, it, because of various market forces and, and, you know, systems has kind of spun out of control. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm just curious, I, I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about that. And I'm just curious what that means for, you know, sort of, capitalist economies like yeah. the US and, and much of Europe, um, yeah. you know, is, 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 are they just in direct opposition to sort of the larger ecosystem, I guess is, is the question. I think they are. Yeah. They're basically, humans evolved from bipedal apes, right? Uh, yeah. And they popul our population was controlled by predators like any animal. Predators and food were, were limiting us. And we learned to ward off the predator by working together and having pointed sticks, and we invented agriculture to make us independent of natural productivity. Mm -hmm. So, so we the control that uh, the various species are under that prevents them their number from exploding were removed by us. It's similar to cells in the body that are controlled in their growth by the by chemical substances and their own genes from from growing. That is, uh, if they grow uh, cells, if they divide and stuff, that is a tumor uh, after. And so we we became, we became, if the world species are considered to be cells of a body, we became canc a cancer, a tumor. And a tumor have this stupid habit of killing their host or killing killing the body that, that housed them. They, they are stupid in that sense. Right. Uh, and parasites are not. Parasites, at least uh, over, 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 over millennia, adjust to the host, and the host learns to live with them. And uh, in fact, uh, parasites don't want to kill the host because they, they, that would kill them, them also. So we have to learn if we consider the, uh, the planet our, our host, we have to learn to be parasites that are mildly irritating but not, not destroying rather than a cancer that yeah. grows out of proportion. And now, the, basically, uh, food-wise, only water and salt, that's the two, only in, two ingredients that are not connected to biodiversity somehow. Everything else is connected to biodiversity to has to grow out of soils, right? And and or always produced by nature uh, in a form of grass uh, and cows and or by plankton and, and, and fish that we eat. Right. All this is connected to biodiversity. And our our incessant destruction of biodiversity um, has has <laughs> a limit. Uh, the when are we go and get there and and we destroy land with uh, soil in uh, the 
amount of arable soil in the world is declining be- because of salinization stuff, while the demand is increasing. People are telling us, well, oh, it's okay because productivity is increasing. But you can, you can twist this system only so far. And mm-hmm. global warming is actually the response of the whole thing. Because global warming is waste, is waste waste carbon dioxide coming out of our various system uh, that cannot be assimilated anymore. When when, uh, the Club of Rome in the the 60s or 70s uh, uh, wrote that uh, our growth, the growth of everything, our economy, would undo us in terms of via pollution, they had not identified the pollutant. But now it's identified, it's the greenhouse gases. Right, right, right. So the, our economy cannot grow forever. Does it, does it put the capitalist system in question? If, if the capitalist system is, is growth forever, multiple huge corporation controlling everything, yes. Yeah. But actually, there are other models of capitalism that uh, are livable and could accommodate that could accommodate this the, the needed transition and we see that in the scandinavian countries uh, uh, where the basically a social democratic system where the the corporation are not so big that they that they determine what the government does uh, and, and 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 through taxes the government has enough power the state uh, by by taxation to intervene and 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 make can determine what infrastructure infrastructure policy we 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 have yeah. and in the US uh, the the opposite has happened the infrastructure uh, the the structure of the economy is determined by big corporation and the US the the state is deprived of taxes to to shape that uh, the decision. So the infrastructure yeah. is falling apart and stuff, but uh, private uh, corporation have all because private corporation have all the money. So I don't think it's it's capitalism itself that is yeah. that is uh, at uh, at risk here, but a certain form of it. And yeah. and it reminds you, it reminds us of the of the New Deal, the way, where the the plutocrats in the thirties, in the twenties and thirties, where we had ruined the economy. Uh, had caused this giant, uh, this giant joblessness and and despair. And where FDR, uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, re- and the war, also World War Two, uh, uh, abolished this class of people through high taxation, ninety percent of the income and stuff, uh, and uh, created the middle class mm-hmm. and created a democratic society, <laughs> which which lasted until uh, uh, 1980 with Reagan and Thatcher in England. Right, right. So so it sounds like uh, perhaps uh, capitalism itself is not uh, the problem. It's, it's sort of that fast growth capitalism. And you talk in the book about Wall Street. Ti- I don't think I can pronounce that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wall Streetization. Um, and you know these companies that are trying to turn around you know twenty percent profits when five to ten percent is normal, yeah. um, and and has been normal since the Babylonian. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and yeah, I was thinking, I was I was talking about this with somebody uh, uh, about that essay in particular, and and um, you know the the Enron company in particular comes yes. to mind. You know those yeah. those sorts of companies that are that are very unethical and and just looking to turn a quick profit. Um, so um, so maybe we should turn this a little bit back to to fisheries. Um, there, there was a passage from the book that I really liked. Um, I'll just read it. But um, so you write, there is a strong public interest in where food comes from, how it was harvested and by whom, and similar questions that were neglected before. This was like forging a new relationship with food in which the delight of discovering a new lover is followed by the discovery of his or her issues, which eventually leads to a reassessment of the relationship, however painful this may be. And I, I, first of all, I love that. Um, and um, my question for you is, h- how have consumer preferences um, influenced demand for seafood? And, um, you know, is that 
demand increasing, decreasing? Um, yeah. Like uh, how? Yeah. So the U.S. Uh, generally, if I talk about the U.S., uh, yeah. uh, don't eat. We're not a seafood eater. Uh, they were not. Uh, they don't know seafood. And uh, basically, we have uh, some companies, uh, mainly aquaculture companies, mm -hmm. uh, farming, fish farming companies, uh, Norwegian salmon, and also catfish in the south, had to revamp the the image of uh, of fish uh, in in order to sell their ware, and so. Uh, people think that uh, farming fish alleviates the pressure, reduces the pressure on uh, fishing wild stocks. It actually doesn't happen because in order to sell your salmon uh, and sell a large quantity of it, you have to create an atmosphere where uh, 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 an image for the salmon that mm -hmm. is actually positive. And this positive image will lead to the consumption not only of salmon but other fish. So the consumption, the, the image of fish have been radically changed. And I noticed that in the, in the 70s when I was uh, visiting uh, the US, uh, the South, uh, it was a sort of pilgrimage. And uh, I, I found an industry having to change the image of catfish because catfish were associated with poor black folks. Right. And they had to invent new a new image for 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 catfish so it could uh southern southern trout it was called <laughs> and uh, all kind of fancy name so it could be sold in the north and and to in the midwest uh in the north uh to people who had uh, this negative image uh, before and it was successful and now catfish is there uh with no taste whatsoever with uh, because actually people who eat fish in the u.s don't like fish really yeah. they, they, they 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 like the sauce that is on it <laughs> and um, and um, and so the image in order to sell more fish uh, that are farmed the image of fish has had had to be transformed and it has been successfully transformed and now fish is associated with health yeah uh, it, it's health and it's it's not flesh so even vegetarian or kind of eat fish and 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 this positive image has uh, has created a huge demand for fish that become a snob appeal and uh, this demand in the west uh, cannot be met by um, by by fisheries uh, mm -hmm. and in fact uh, have led to a competition for fish between developing world countries and and uh, and uh, rich west and uh, also the rich east because japan and china import huge quantity of fish now and <clears throat> they it goes uh, basically uh, the competition occurs at uh, some level that people are not aware of which is the sardine and anchovies and other small fish Mm -hmm. that uh, people in Africa or even people in Europe eat yeah, yeah, yeah. are co converted into fish meal which is fed then to salmon and uh, is uh, sold as uh, good fish. The point is that sardine and anchovies and stuff are themselves good fish. They're in fact better fish than salmon. Right. Uh, but but they, they taste fishy and the fish, right. the fish eaters in the US actually don't as I said, they don't really like fish because, <laughs> and you notice that because they don't like sardine because they are fishy. Yeah, uh, so they're they're going for fish that are uh, maybe like, the most uh, sort of like uh, other kinds of meats or something like yeah, that. Like, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so we have the the Norwegian uh, marine harvest and uh, the other corporation that produce uh, 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 fish. Uh, they produce fish by grinding up other fish mm. and they, they grind up fish that actually are food fish and that are consumed by people in the developing world. So they don't actually produce food, they consume food and people are not aware of that and they when they talk about aquaculture because the aquaculture of the farming of carnivores, because they, these fish are like lions, right? They eat other fish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, the farming of cannibals doesn't produce fish, it consumes fish. Uh, the, the, the farming of, of, of oysters, of, yeah. or, of clams, that is a net production. And in fact, most aquaculture is the farming of animals low in the food web, which uh, don't need to be fed uh, fish meal. But uh, as fisheries produce, capture fisheries produce less and less large fish, or they are, uh, they are now produced in, in, in fish farming operation and grinding up the small fish. But that kind of thing works only for very rich country. Uh, in poor countries, they cannot do it. Yeah. So, so is the net result then that, that the people that live in these poorer countries uh, just don't have food or are they just, just they, not eating they fish? They don't or? have fish on their market that they can eat. Yeah. And that's one reason, or as crazy as it sounds, why, for example, Senegalese fishermen uh, end up on, on boats trying to get into Europe and drown in, in the middle of the Mediterranean. Mm. Uh, there is, uh, if you impoverish a country and they cannot fish, they cannot do anything, what, are, what else are they supposed to do to support their families? Right, right. So then they're sort of pulled into the, the, this global fish uh, catch or, or fish trade yeah. that, that they're I, trying to I'm, compete in. I'm fairly confident that something like that also is working in Central America mm -hmm. and is pushing people out to seek refuge in the U.S. Not only the violence of gangs, but also the economic opportunities that are not there anymore. And, and basically because the economy is structured around export, uh, so they don't have anything left anymore. Another bit of information I found surprising is that a lot of this global fish trade is subsidized by governments and in the form of subsidies for fuel for, for the fishing it's not fleet. Trade. This, uh, no, that's not right. What subsidizes the catching. Uh huh. The the catching is subsidized by about um, uh, thirty billion per year. That's about one quarter to one third of the of the gross of fisheries. And um, this is difficult to understand, mm -hmm. but basically, uh, lots of fishing by especially industrial fishing by big boats. Uh, is extremely costly, right? You you have to go further and further shore, or, or away, and basically you cannot. The resource uh, depleted, so you don't catch per, per hour or per day enough to to cover the cost. So you get subsidies that keeps you going. So the basically when when I was a, a student, I learned that the fisheries would be automatically would be self-regulating because when the stocks go down mm -hmm. they would not not not, op not continue to operate uh, because there would be a signal coming straight from nature that tells you hey I'm all fished leave me alone and if there were no subsidies the signal would be heard and they would concentrate uh, on fishing areas where there are fish and uh, and when there are no fish they would not uh, buy new boats to to operate right, elsewhere, right. Uh, or all of this uh, is subverted by uh, by uh, by subsidies. If a government uh, gives subsidies, and uh, the EU governments, uh, uh, for example, Spain and France and stuff, give sub huge subsidies to fisheries, they they can afford to fish a, a stock that is totally overfished, that is depleted. In that case, they fish subsidies. They don't fish fish. Mm. And uh, and uh, this this keeps the thing going. Also, uh, China, uh, Japan uh, are huge subsidizers. Uh, so basically, it would be if the computer industry was uh, subsidizing the sales uh, of Apple II computers because you know you have to keep the workers at in uh, Silicon Valley going. Uh, it would be comp it's completely absurd. And Apple II is. Not, not the thing that we need, but that's what we do in fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, how much of the sort of expanded fishing going on is driven by technology? Are there technologies that are allowing this to happen as well? Technology can be also perceived as uh, countering the effect of depletion uh -huh. because 
because if you can extract fish from a place where where not nobody could extract fish then you you have an edge and in fact in fact the last hundred years have been technology driven the the big big the big step in technology is the appearance in 1880 of the first steam driven trawler trawlers mm-hmm. boats that use fossil energy as opposed to sails they caught 10 to 100 times more than similar boats of the same size uh, uh, that were using sail. So they they were very powerful, they emptied the sea around Britain, and they immediately had to fish further offshore. And and this is what led to the war between Iceland and, and uh, UK, the Cod Wars, uh, later, uh, 50 years later, mm-hmm. because it were used to fishing in Iceland, and the Icelanders didn't want them anymore. And, and they had they had hostilities that were actually quite violent to get the Brits out. So then, after after steam, there was winches were invented, mm. where where men don't have to lift the net with their hands. Right, right. Uh, and then and then diesel replaced uh, replaced uh, 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 steam. Uh, coal and basically all the invention that were used uh, to in uh, in World War One uh, to to propel uh, uh, war warships were adapted and all the invention that were used to detect German submarines <laughs> were were used to detect uh, uh, to detect uh, fish schools so basically echo sounders radar yeah. and satellite navigation all of this is uh, was developed for war purpose to force mm. and world war ii was another uh, development in this line even spotter plane were used at first for spotting traces uh, of submarine and uh, they they are used in the gulf of mexico yeah. to go up the tuna yeah. so basically we adapted war technology to 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 fight against fish and we have won the war against fish yeah not surprisingly right i mean yeah not surprisingly their their brain about big like this yeah (laughs) wow okay well that's it yeah it's an interesting perspective really like it's like we're waging a war on the fish that um, and we win obviously they can't win yeah (laughs) one thing i just wanted to circle back to real quick so we talked about the the sea around us project and I, know, I, le- I did take a look through some of the data and it looks like it goes back to 1950 mm-hmm. um, which I guess is when the FAO report began started began to produce global data on an annual basis yeah um, and so how has it changed because we talked about the total amount but how has how, how has the catch changed from, from that time to well to the, the catch in the 50s were mainly coastal and they they have changed in being uh, uh, from deeper water. Um, they have changed in being global. Uh, at in the fifties, uh, in the fifties, the the countries of Africa and many countries of Asia were colonies of European countries, and they did not develop anything um, in fisheries. So it it, uh, it, it is. Uh, a contrast-rich situation where you can compare the 50s with the 70s, 80s, 90s. And uh, so the 50s was a different world. Uh, The countries, the the third world did not exist. These were all colonies. And and, uh, optimism also reigned supreme. If you you put boat in the water, you will get more fish. And it was true. And, uh, And people learn later, gradually, uh, it became less and less true in Peru. The first collapse was in in seven in the early 70s, where more boats uh, didn't mean more fish. Uh, in fact, the the whole fishery, which was a monster fishery, collapsed because of a warming event. Mm. Uh, that was a piece of the of the future in uh, in, in coming in the, in the 70s. Uh, and then there were other collapses, and a spectacular one uh, of. Um, of uh, the northern cod in Canada in right. 92 
uh, that was uh, very influential because because Canada was supposed to be the best run fishery in the world, uh, the best uh, the best science, the best management regime, and everything. And uh, I, as a kid, I grew up in Switzerland. Uh, the Canadian were the best, also the best hockey player. So, uh, <laughs> so when I came the first time to Canada in '73. I, the first thing I did was uh, buy a, a, ho- a Canadian hockey stick. And then I went on a German research vessel that was fishing off, the, off Canada, off Newfoundland. And we fished at one kilometer depth. And we fished, we fished uh, uh, with, a, with a net that was so big that a whole building could have been, you know, the, the four jumbo jet uh, beside each other. Could have been and gone. We brought stones up, fish also, but also you know this round stone from glaciers, uh, uh, as big as a Volkswagen. That was the boat that was used to explore the the cod, and yeah. and in retrospect, they had we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. They were uh, they were Russian fishing there. They were the, the Soviet East German were fishing there. Poles. Cubans were even fishing there. It was like a like a gold rush, uh, and everybody was helping themselves. and And the the catch, which had been uh, about hundred to two hundred thousand tons for five hundred years, became seven hundred thousand tons, mm-hmm. almost eight hundred million, eight hundred thousand tons. And then it it all crashed, obviously, because the two hundred thousand ton that were caught had been caught but fish from the depth that came to within 50 meters of the surface. And they were caught by traps and lines and stuff. And it was sustainable. You, you got only the fish that wanted to commit suicide that came up. And, and so it was the interest from a capital that was in the bank, right? And what these big boats that I was in as a student did is open the bank open the the, the 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 vault and and grab all the money right right so the no more interest no more fishery no more bank no more everything the, the fishery collapsed and 50,000 people got jobless from one day to the other wow. in in the province and that that is that got lots of people to think but because it was spectacular but this happened this happened throughout the world in a smaller edition all the time, so you have a steady erosion, and yeah. and the catch in the, in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, has declined since seventy five. Since seventy five, it is going down, down, down. But it has been masked for by for for consumers by the fact that fish comes from Asia, from from the mm. Antarctica, and so on. Right, right, and we often don't know where where that fish comes from. Yeah. Uh, yeah um i guess i guess the bigger question is what does the future hold um is there we talked about sort of technology driving a lot of this uh economics driving this um and are there are there any technological or economic uh tools that we can use to get out of the 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 overfishing problem that we have and um, are there any that you're personally excited about or yeah. would like to see happen? So the, the sad thing about, about this situation is that we conceptually have all the tools available uh, to solve this. The, this is not, as lots of people think, a wicked problem. Uh, for example, the negotiation to get rid of subsidies uh, at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, on the first run, were extremely successful. It, it, they, they failed for a little detail, which is that the fishery subsidies and the agricultural subsidies were connected. And, and so the countries that want to get rid of subsidies on fisheries don't want to touch those in agriculture. In agriculture. And, and so the talks collapse. But getting rid of subsidies would immediately uh, do away with marginal players uh, of which which the which the majority of of boats are marginal mm-hmm. 
Uh, another policy thing is to encourage small-scale fishers, uh, uh, opera owner-operated fisheries, because they have a stake in 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 the, in the fishery that a corporation doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have to set up quota everywhere, and quota uh, that uh, are not exceeded uh, with can serve to rebuild stocks. And in fact, in the US, there is a very good law, a very good legislation called the magnuson Stevens Act mm -hmm. that mandates rebuilding. That is an example for the laws that, uh, led, uh, for legislation that uh, all other countries should have. This mandated rebuilding that uh, must uh, bring the, the stock back to a reasonable level within 10 years. That is important, it was in 10 years. Lots of people, including the present administration in the US, want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, what a best, the best legislation in the world, actually, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to fisheries. So the tools are available to improve on that. And another tool, which is pursued by the, uh, uh, by the Pew Child Trust, which uh, began the, the whole story with the, the sea rounders, is to, to withdraw from part of the world. Because the expansion that uh, we have, we have uh, allowed to happen is, is a problem. We have mm -hmm. to withdraw from parts of the world and that's called large marine protected areas. Uh, we have to, to let some of the world be itself. Uh, that's the reason why we, for example, have, still have giraffes. You know, giraffes are very visible. They have this long neck, they stick up. We could get rid of all giraffes within within days, right? Mm -hmm. All giraffes in the world. Well, we have giraffes in existence only because we let them. We let them because we have given them part of their world. We couldn't do that with cockroaches, incidentally, not even with rabbits. We couldn't. We, we don't decide to let cockroach live. They, they decide uh, <laughs> what they do. <laughs> but giraffes exist only because we let them. And, and we have to do that for sharks, for other big fish, for tuna and so on. Because otherwise, they won't exist. Right. Would you agree with um, the biologist E.O. Wilson's idea that half we need to half the world to I set think, aside think, as, as wild I think, spaces? I think it's, it's, it's wonderful uh, because it... Uh, it um, appeals, this idea appeals to us um, in our sense of equity. You, you, you have a friend, you give half of what you have, you share. You, you find a, an apple as a kid, you're running on the street, you split it in two, your, your friend gets half. You. Any other way of splitting the apple is, is problematic. And uh, I think this is a, a fantastic idea. Yeah. You can okay. rally around people, 10% or 20%, uh, and uh, that it, it looks like a like you're negotiating in the bazaar, you know. But uh, half of the world, that is uh, a beautiful idea. I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. And uh, the book, again, is called Vanishing Fish, Shifting Baselines and the Future of Global Fisheries. And um, that will be out, I believe, May 28th. Is that correct? Yeah, that could be something like yeah, that. Yeah, end, end of May. Um, and I really enjoyed reading it. And they're short, they're short essays. But uh, as I mentioned uh, when we first started talking, I, I just really like your style of writing, and, and they're really enjoyable to read. So thank you very so. much. Well, that's it for this show. If you learned something, be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons. Also, click that little bell to get notifications about new episodes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.